interesting time when I finish one series and I start another one. Um, I know you're always on the edge of your seat and you can't wait for what's going to come next. So we're going to start here. We're going to do a little interaction this morning. Um, raise your hand if you were in school, including college, during any of these decades. All right, I knew I'd get most of the room, so we're good there, okay? And, I, and it's funny, when you think about sayings from these different decades, uh, I did not come up with this list. I, I cheated and went online. I didn't poll people from every decade. I didn't have time for that, okay? So this is what I want you to do. If, if you said any of these sayings at one time or another, I want you to just put your hand up, okay, and leave it up. All right, and you have to put another hand up, then we'll know you're, you got struck twice with these things. All right, in the 60s, here are some of them. Daddy-O, Groovy, Hippie, The Man. Come on, you referred to, you know, The Man. The 70s, Catch You on the Flip Side, Dig It, Get Down, or Boogie. All right, Paula was right up there. Keep your hands up, come on. The 80s, rad. Gag me with a spoon. Gnarly, wicked, totally mint. All right, I got you know, hands up going all over the place. Amen, amen. The 90s, dis. Homie or homeboy. Or my bad. Fat with the PH. And word, that's just just word. The 2000s, peeps, not like the marshmallow ones, just, you know, my peeps. Sweet, bling, chillax. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a cringy word now, cringy. And then sketchy, all right? Only Frank kept his hand up the whole time. The rest of you are like, this is so tiring. Okay, you put your hands down. Right? I always wonder, you can put your hands down now, that's enough. You always wonder, where do these things get started, right? Like, anyone ever thought about it? Like, who's, who actually can claim, oh, I said chillax first, and then it took off. But what happens is, what happens? These get popular because someone says it, someone else says it, someone else says it, and through repetition, it just gets spread around and around and around and around. Uh, anyone ever use flashcards when studying? Okay. You get the same information, and you go over and over and over and over again. Um, I want to let you in on a little secret. I don't know if Frank or Gabby do the same thing, but when I have to learn a new song for worship, I have to listen to it again and again and again until I know it without like thinking about it. I, I want the song to like, you know, just be in my heart and my soul and my mind. I don't have to. I don't have to go. Wait, how does that go? Um, and I know. On a more important thing, this is a powerful thing in our home. Uh, when Claire went through her battle with cancer, there were scriptures. Someone actually sent her this packet of, of scripture, uh, like scriptures about healing, and they were up all over our house, on our kitchen, on our mirror, everywhere. And, and, and it was powerful. And I, and, and I want to, this is where we're going to go uh, for the next little while. There's power in repetition. When something gets in our head, it has an easier time to get into our heart, the totality of who we are. Remember, the heart isn't just the beating thing in our, in our chest. That the, the Bible, when it talks about our heart, it's the totality of who we are. But here's a huge warning. Okay? How many people read the warning labels? Okay. Yeah, right. You're like, yeah, whatever. You have ripped that tag off that pillow. Come on. How many people? I love doing that. It says not to do it. Ripping it off. Okay? Uh, now, this is an important warning. When something gets in our head, it has the easier time to get in our heart. That also has to do with negative, evil, and hurtful things. The more we hear it over and over and over and over again, regardless of the source, regardless if they meant it, regardless if we force-fed it ourselves and opened ourselves up to it, it gets from here into here. And so that's what I want you to think about as we get started this morning. I was asking God what to speak on, which I often do. And what's interesting, it doesn't always happen the same way twice. Uh, something, I wish the process was exactly the same way every time. Um, that would be the repetition that I would like, but it doesn't always work like that. Uh, so sometimes I have to stand on my head and then spin around. I'm just joking. Um, God just uses different things to start triggering thoughts and things. And so I was actually uh, been, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that in my own personal reading, I'm in the Psalms. 
And I actually sometimes uh, feel like that's cheating as a pastor if I'm already reading something in, in my own devotions and then God starts speaking to me. I'm like, no, no, I, give me something else because I'm just doing this already. It feels like a, a, a cheat, but it's not, of course. And so I was starting in the, the, this uh, book of, the, of Psalms, uh, chapter, Psalm 119. And so my first thought was like, oh, wow, this is a long one. If you've ever read Psalm 119. And it's actually funny, two psalms before that is like the shortest psalm ever. It's like two verses, and you're like, oh, wow. And then it goes to Psalm 119, and you're like, wow. So I read the first eight verses, and then I went down to my study Bible, and I want to read to you exactly what it said. And I just was reading. It says, this is both the longest psalm and the lowest, I'm sorry, the longest chapter in the Bible. It may have been, it may have been written by Ezra after the temple was rebuilt, Ezra chapter 6. As a repetitive meditation on the beauty of God's word and how it helps us stay pure and grow in faith. Psalm 119 has 22 carefully constructed sections, each corresponding to a different letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and each verse beginning with the letter of its section. Almost every verse mentions God's word. Such repetition was common in the Hebrew culture. People did not have personal copies of the scripture as we do, so God's people memorized his word and passed it along orally. The structure of this psalm allowed for easy memorization. And I was like, oh, cool, that's really interesting as I beginning to read Psalm 119. So I read a portion of Psalm 119, and then I picked up a book that I'm reading as well. And again, I'm not always into like, ooh, like signs, but this was, I felt like, pretty good. I was asking God, Lord, lead me what I'm supposed to speak on Sunday. I read Psalm 119, and then in this book, I'm reading this book by Mark Batterson called Win the Day. Um, and literally the spot I'm in, I, I, I'm not one of those people that can sit down. I can do it, but I don't often do it and read like 10 chapters of any book all at once. So right in the subtitle, it literally says, Ritual Reminders. And I'm like, whoa, I just read about this like literally seconds later. And here's what he said. The idea of ritualizing every activ everyday activities is as old as the Jewish people putting ritual reminders called mezuzah on their doorframe. Instead of compartmentalizing the commandments, they integrated them into their daily routines. How? Through the mother of all learning, repetition. Repeat them again and again to your children. This sounds like rote learning, but it required creativity and intentionality. It involved environmental engineering and choice architecture. They surrounded themselves with ritual reminders that sacramentized every moment. Did you know that an observant Jewish person pronounces a hundred blessings a day. If you do something a hundred times a day, it becomes a way of life. And I was like, okay, God, I think you're speaking to me. I think we're going to, you know, repeat and keep talking about this. And here we go. So this is where we're going to be for a little while. We're going to start a series today called On Repeat. And you're going to be terribly disappointed because I'm just going to speak the same sermon over for the next 18 weeks and see if you're paying attention, all right? And so I want to read to you. He mentioned a couple of verses in this part of the book, and I'm going to read them in their totality to you. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Okay? I'm going to read from the NIV first. It says, I'm not going to put it on the screen, so if you have your Bible, you can open it. I'm just going to read it to you. We'll, we'll, I'll put it up on the screen later. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. But I figured I'd read it, not just from one version, but from two more. So welcome to the stage, Pastor Joe and Julie. Ladies first. I'm going to read from the NLT. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. 
Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the ESV. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be your frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> psalm 19 is actually known as the giant psalm. <laughs> um, obviously, it makes sense. That's what it will be known as. And I wanna, I'm going to set some things up to you for today. We're actually not even going to get into Psalm 119 today. Okay? Because there's actually so much in there. Uh, I, 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 there's some groundwork that's really important to cover. So in Psalm 119, it refers to God's law eight different ways. That sounds like repetition, right? When you, when you hear the same thing, eight different ways. Anybody a visual learner? Anybody a hands-on learner? Right? There's all different types of ways to learn. Some people can listen, some people need to read and listen, and some people would do hands-on. And so the Bible does that sometimes in repetition and, and in, in, intentionally. And we all know that it works, Right? Because we've heard things over and over again. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Right? Jenny didn't even have to think about that. It just came out like, <gasps> right? It's scary how repetition does work. There are things, and, and, and the media knows that, just so you know. That's why intentionally they want to get certain things in your head. The Bible does the same thing too, uh, and it's more important than a jingle. So here's a couple of words. I'm going to quickly define them because it's really important moving forward. And so if you get lost during the next couple of uh, months, because for Psalm 119, has got a lot of verses. Uh, we're going to go through them in bite-sized pieces. These are critically important to go back to so you can listen to this message again. So th this is four out of the eight. I'm just going to quickly read through some definitions of these words. Law. Now you could say, don't they all mean the same thing? Yes, but then they're also a little different. And so when the Bible's using them, it's it intentionally touching on certain things. So this is the law, the Torah. It means to teach and to direct. It's instruction flowing from the revelation of God as the basis for life and action. A single command or a whole body. This is often referring to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So it might use this word, law. A statuette speaks of the scriptures, high standards, and frank warnings. Frank, I don't know why there's warnings just for you, but there are. It just said that, frank warnings. And also it's dependability. A faithful and true witness. How many know that the scripture has high standards? Right? And often we look at them and go, oh, I, I can't do that. That's, that's impossible. And that's kind of the point. And that's what the law is also always trying to do. Right? To make us realize we're not good enough. We're never going to be able to accomplish this. Aha! That's always the point. To lead us to Jesus who, who fulfilled the law. Amen? All right. Get a little excited. I'm excited, so I want you to be excited with me. Precept. This is an officer or overseer, a man who is responsible to look closely into a situation and take action. So the word points to the particular instructions of the Lord as one who cares about detail. Where's my detail, people? Come on. Someone told me already this morning, they, they know someone who's a little OCD about things, right? And sometimes that can be a blessing. And this is the idea that God cares about our details, and isn't that good? That he doesn't just go, oh, I wasn't paying attention. He knows details, and there's, there's instruction and precepts and laws that are there for specific reasons, because those are important. A decree. It's derived from the root of the word engrave or inscribe. God reveals his royal sovereignty by establishing his divine will in nature and in the covenant community. Here's four more words. Command. This word emphasizes the straight authority of what is said, not merely the power of to convince or persuade, but the right to give orders. Six, ordinances or laws. And I know we use the word law already, but that's different sometimes in context than laws. Here's what it says. Decisions of the all-wise judge about common human situations. And hence, 
the revealed rights and duties appropriate to them. The word is just word. I know it sounds funny, and you're going to see the word word again. But this is capital word, embracing God's truth in any form, stated, promised, or commanded. And then the idea of a promise or a lowercase word, it's just derived from the word to say it. So you said your promise. You said your word. And so I want you to understand, when, when the Bible speaks of these, it's not just rules to get you caught and be like, ha-ha, I got you, you didn't follow the rule, you're out. It's to reveal something. And in this case, in Psalm 119, the, uh, or Deuteronomy, rather, the writer is showing true piety. And here's how he's tr- showing true piety. Piety, a love of God, not dried up by study, but refreshed and formed and nourished by it. And that's what God wants when we read the Bible. And let's be honest, sometimes we felt more like the first part of that definition. This is dry. This is boring. I don't understand it. Come on, I'll raise my hand first so you feel better about yourself. I've, I've said that. I, I, I've had moments where I'm like, ah, it doesn't feel like the way the psalmist is writing about it. It's water to my soul. Like, no, it feels like something I have to do and I have to get through and I'm struggling right now. And so there's, there's, a, there's a process that will help us alleviate that, to get to that point. There's a saying long ago, and I don't like it, but I've heard it, and, and it just makes me laugh, if anything. It says, too much of the word, and you'll dry up. Too much of the spirit, and you'll blow up. So I don't know where that came from. Probably heard it in Bible college, and it's like, yeah, maybe. But uh, if anything, it's just the, 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 the idea is, is, is not to get so... Uh, critically thinking about the Bible that we just sap all the life out of it. It's to realize that it's life-giving words, and the Holy Spirit coupled with the word can bring that, that refreshing element to that. That we're not dried up, we're refreshed, we're informed, we're nourished by the word. We read God's word and not just go, okay, I did it for today. I, I read my daily bread and my devotional. I got it done with, but we actually have to find that we gain life from it. And we say, oh, wow. And that's the point of it. That's even the point of some of these ideas of the law. And even the Jewish people struggled with that. Here's a couple of things that the word does when we allow it to. It brings delight. This is not just some scholarly joy that, hey, I read through these many chapters today or these many books. But it's rooted in a disciple who's following in obedience. That it literally brings joy when we're like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to understand this. I'm beginning to live this out, and it's bringing delight to me. You'll see this throughout Psalm 119. And deeper than that delight is, is love. And Scripture can evoke this type of love that we didn't understand that we needed. Amen? And that, that's even available. We're like, whoa, this is the kind of love that I've been looking for. And often Scripture will do that. And again, if these aren't powerful enough, then there's strength. Words like awesome wonders, righteous, faithful, eternal. We're going to hear repetitively spoken throughout Psalm 119. And so it makes us full of delight and love, and then there's strength there. Here's the benefits of God's Word. It can bring liberation. This was such a profound quote to me, and I I want to read it to you regarding liberation. So if the idea that God is Master or Lord, therefore... Service to him is perfect freedom. And I was like, whoa. It made me like stand back, like, whoa, if he's remember and he he he's the master in the right way. He laid down his life for us. He's not he's not forcing us to do something, but he's the master and the Lord. So service unto him for us is perfect freedom, perfect liberty. Wow, do you ever think about that? We don't often. We're like, what do I gotta do to get to heaven? What do I got to do to get through this day? What do I got to do to stay on God's good side? And it's not about that. It's that he's the master, and when I'm obedient to him, I have perfect freedom. I, 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 I'm, I'm living in perfect liberty and freedom, amen? And we have to rediscover that. Here's another one, light. Even in Psalm 119, you, when you get to this point in Psalm 119, we're all going to, oh, I know that verse. It lights my feet and my path. It brings insight, understanding, discernment, wisdom. How many people could use some of that? All right? And we need that. And so it brings that light into our our life. It brings life. God's law is restorative and life-giving. It turns our eyes and our steps towards Him. And the last one is stability. 
basing our hope and our comfort not on just how we feel, but on his dependable word and his promises. And I want you to understand that when we read God's word, we're not just tricking our mind and saying, okay, let's just say this. It's not some mantra or some way we're tricking our brain. It's like this is truth. And we're letting that truth impact our mind and then get into our heart. Amen? And sometimes that means we got to say it over and over and over again. We're going to see that this is a very, very common thing. All right, back to um, Deuteronomy. I'm going to read from the NLT, and we're going to walk through these verses a little bit. It says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. This sounds familiar, right? We, we've, we've heard this before. Jesus echoes this in Matthew 22. He says, te- they ask him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And, you know, they're always trying to get that trick question to Jesus or, or find, the, find the shortcut or the loophole. And he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So let me define a couple words that were in both of these verses in Deuteronomy and Matthew. We've talked about them before, but it's always helpful to hear it again. Amen? All right? That's what I want you to understand. So if you you hear certain things in, in church, and you're like, I've heard that before. There's a, there's a purpose for it. Even if in the Bible, when it repeats things, the repetitiveness is not just to be like, all right, I've heard this. Why are they saying this again? Because it's important. It's something we need to know. So here's the idea of heart. In the Old Testament, physiology, it refers to the mind or the will, the center of the intellect, who we are. That's our heart, the heart of who we are. The idea of the soul is, describes the person himself or herself the essential being, especially the desires or the longings. All right? So because we, we can have our own concept of this. And that's why it's always important to get into biblical idea of what they were thinking of when they used heart, when they used soul. And then the last one is strength. It's not an element of one's being, but of human activity, what one does. So here's how the command is wrapped up. The command is to be obedient to God with fullness of being, and totality of effort. So when you're putting your whole heart into it, that means you're putting everything. Like everything that is inside of you that you can't grasp, and yet putting in effort. And that's where we start to go, whoa, okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And if I asked the room right now, my hand would go down first. You know, to say, oh, is everyone doing that 100%? Like, mm, some days, it depends. And that's, that's, once again, Jesus' own words from Deuteronomy 2. Are you doing that? We're incapable of doing that on our own. We're going to struggle. It's going to be difficult to do in our own strength. Here's what it says about this law, about these ideas. It's not just to put them on a bumper sticker, not just to put them on a t-shirt, but it says this, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. The idea is this word, repeat. And it actually doesn't mean what we think it would mean. Uh, We think, right, as a repeat, is just say it again, say it again. But the biblical definition is actually this idea of being sharp. Listen to this definition. Impressing the words of covenant faith into the thinking of his children, talking about this verse, by inscribing them there with indelible sharpness and precision. The image is that of an engraver of a monument who takes hammer and chisel in hand and with painstaking care etches a text into the face of a solid slab of granite. The sheer labor of such a task is daunting indeed, but once done, the message is there to stay. And I know you want me to show God's chisel to her, but I'm going to hold off, right? right? But the idea, right, isn't that, like, would you think of that when you think of the word repeat? No. But that's what happens when something's on repeat. 
It's getting etched into our heart and our mind over and over and over and over until it's not removable. So my question is to you today, what's on repeat in your life? What are you listening to? What are you hearing? And I don't just mean like listening with ear, ear, earbuds and in your ears. Or what, what voices, what, what truths, what wisdom are you listening to over and over and over again? Because it's etching something in your heart and your soul, and it will affect you. And will it draw you closer to God, or will it draw you away? I can't answer that for you, but God can. Look at this, what it says. Talk at them at home, on the road, going to bed, getting up. What if we started this habit? I won't say that I'm good. I'm I'm more challenged by this. First thing in the morning. Like, first thing in the morning. Like, like maybe while your coffee is brewing. (laughs) God's Word. Sometime during the day, and if you think about the idea of some people have a commute or in their house, sometime during the day being intentional about it, and then last thing on your mind before you go to bed. What if you just started there? I mean, that verse is trying to cover the whole day, meaning ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And what do you do with your children already? You tell them things you want them to do all day. Clean up your room, clean up your room, clean up your room, clean up your room, clean up after yourself. And you hope that they get that. But even more than those things is God's word being spoken about over and over and over again. And this isn't just for parents with children. This is for us, wherever we find ourselves in life, what's on repeat in our life. I'm not saying I'm good at this, because I wrote this down as a challenge, and not to get on TV or the phones or newspaper or email first thing when we, when we step out of the bed. And I'm guilty, right? I've got to check something. I'm looking at email. I want to do this. I've got to do that. Let me get some things out of the way first. And it goes on to say this, and this is where we can sometimes think like we would skip over this verse. It's like, what are they talking about? Tie them to your hands. And wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is most likely more of a metaphor than a figurative thing. But what do we do as humans? We take things like this and be like, let's literally do it and then we'll do it. And I don't think it's wrong because we, we do that. We, it's easier if it's on a sign. It's easier if it's just a, something we physically do than if we let it internally change us. But it's a very human response. Even Jesus talks about this. Matthew 23, 5, I'm just giving you a short little thing. He's talking about the Pharisees. He says, everything they do is done for people to see. They make <laughs> their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. Anybody know what phylacteries are? I had to look it up, right? Because I also had to look up how to say it because I try not to butcher words that I don't know how to say. I probably would have read over that word. I don't know. That never jumped out to me. I've never seen this verse on a t-shirt, you know. Uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, the phylacteries. Phylacteries are small leather parchment boxes containing a piece of vellum, which is paper, inscribed with four texts. If you're interested, here's the text. Exodus 13, 2 through 10, 11 through 16. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, 11 through uh, 11, 13 through 21. I know you're dying to see them. Here they are. There's a phylactery, like literally a leather box with scrolls in it. And they literally would wear them. There's someone wearing a phylactery, and then there's their their hands are tied, just like the verse says, and one of them's tied to their arm, too. Here's, here's a guy rocking it. There it is. All right? I'm not, I'm not, please don't misunderstand. I'm not making fun. Like, they took those verses, and, and that's what it says. And so that's not shocking. And I give them credit, because that's what it says. And the other idea about the doorposts is the mezuzah, Old Testament doorposts. But as they went post-biblical times to the tiny plaques attached to the doorpost, which also contain scripture. This is more of a modern version of it, but it's there. And it's not wrong if there's a point and a purpose behind it. And so, that's what I'm saying. We can have a plaque in our house, and, and we do, with scripture on it, with good reminders, but we walk by them every day, and it's not getting in here. Looks nice. It's helpful. Maybe. But I want to 
bring this to a spot where we think of, and maybe you've heard this term, I've heard it for years as a teenager, and I used it as a youth pastor, and I still do as a pastor, but garbage in, garbage out. That's just naturally what's going to happen. And so this isn't to make us feel bad. This is to make us realize that even within the Bible writings, they were trying to repetitively remind themselves of God's word and his promises because we often as humans, we forget. And so if putting a leather box on your head would make you remember, I guarantee after a few weeks you would forget it was there. And like, I don't even know what's in those verses. And that's what can happen. And that's why Jesus says, they're doing this stuff, but they're missing the point. It's not wrong, but if they're missing the point, then it is pointless. Like I said, next week we're going to go in and there's going to be repetition of Scripture. And I believe that repetition of Scripture, just in Psalm 119 alone, is going to form some godly habits in us. It takes many days, right, to form a habit. I know that it varies depending on which site you check of 20-something days to 30-something days. But if you do something every day, every day, then it becomes a habit. But you don't want to do something habitually and then miss the whole point. You're like, I did it, but I don't know what I did. I just did it. And that's what we fight, right, with the, with the word of religion versus relationship. Neither one of those ro- words are, are wrong or right or more right because religious things we do all the time. I mentioned your coffee already, right? Some of you are pretty religious about your coffee. Come on, testify. You're already getting a little edgy because you need a third cup, all right? You don't have to think about it, and, and it will wake you up. I mean, I'm the coffee maker, I am the Hebrews of, of our house. Um, and I have woken up sometimes. Oh, I didn't get the coffee set up. I, and I have to secretly hide into the garage because the grinder will wake up Claire and, yeah! and run the coffee grinder. And it's just something we do. It's not, a, it's not wrong, right? It's just a habitually thing that we do. And so the point of, that, of our series is to get what's on repeat in our heart and our life. Psalm 119 is intentionally, they said, the description of it, they're repeating it over and over again. What? To make it easy to memorize. And not just to say, I know it, but to let that stuff sink in. Modern choruses like worship songs, they get a bad rap from the older generation because they say, they're always repeating the same thing over and over again. Actually, that's pretty Jewish. So don't take it, it's a bad rap. So if you have something going on in your head and it's a worship song and it's going on and repeat, praise the Lord. That's good. That's why you do that sometimes, okay? I know it doesn't seem very creative in the moment, but sometimes we need that. We need to hear something simple over and over and over and over and over again. It's so powerful when it's used for God's purpose. So what's on repeat? In your heart and your mind and your soul. What's on repeat? Like I said, I, I, I know that little button. That's what that little symbol means if you don't know, if you have any sort of audio player on your phone or anything. You hit repeat, and that little symbol means it's going to repeat the same thing. And if you click it again, a little one appears. That means it's just going to repeat that one thing over and over again. But here's the other question that I have to balance it out with is that warning. What lies have you been believing about yourself over and over and over again? Maybe it's not even from an outside source. Maybe it's from this source in here. I believe these lies. I've heard them in my life, so now I'm starting to believe them and I'm repeating them to myself. What half-truths about your situation in life have you been allowing to creep in? And you hear it every day. What false things about God and morality have you heard over and over? And man, they sneak them in everywhere. Please be warned. Okay. Oh, but it's so catchy. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's such a great show. What are they telling you? What truths about God's word and morality? Oh, it's okay if you do this, this, and this, because it's just a show. Do you believe that? Okay. We had the privilege to be in high schools uh, a few weeks ago with John Pritikin, who spoke here at the, ch- at the church. And I was shocked, because I haven't been in the high school during high school hours in many years. Um, and s- this is partly probably because of pandemic, <laughs> And just the life and age of teenagers this doesn't make anybody feel bad, or, and I'm not picking on anyone, because adults can do this too. But many teenagers that came into these school assemblies had earphones on. 
and masks on, and I'm not making it, not, and hoods on. They just look like they were enclosed in their own little world. And so many of them are on their phones. And actually, John Pritikin brought one of them up and said, what are you listening to? And he put the, ear, the microphone by their ear, and they were listening to music, like while they're talking to other people. And this isn't to go, oh my gosh, because we're doing the same thing. So don't be shocked when the, the morals and the standards, and we already said the Bible has high standards, when the morals and the standards of this world are creeping into our society, and we're like, how did that happen? Because we let it. Because we chose to listen and to hear and to read all of this stuff for whatever purpose and said, oh, it's no big deal. And we've slowly become... The word is desensitized. We don't even know it's happening. We don't even know it's there. But when you have God's word on repeat, and I'm challenged, I'm not saying, like, I I can grow in this. When I've got God's word coming over and over again on repeat, and I'm hearing it, I believe some good things are going to happen. Amen? I believe some of those benefits that we talked about are going to happen. I'm going to go back and read them. Because I I didn't repeat them enough to you. No. Liberation. Light, life, stability. These are important. This is what Psalm 119 is going to ingrain in our head. And, the, and remember, the, the, the idea here is, is not just to trick our brain. It's not just to say it again and again, and then I'll eventually believe it, and it will become true, okay? I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I dream about it every night and day. I mean, if I got on the roof of the church and said that every day, it's not going to happen. Okay? I might feel better about myself. I might even be feel more willing to try to fly. Okay? That's not going to happen. That's what this is. Please understand, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what God's word is talking about. Oh, if you just believe something over and over again, it's going to happen. No, this is God's truth. It's his word. He said it. He will make it come true. Amen? He is the author of it, so he's got to prove it in our heart and our life. Not you. You don't believe you psych yourself into it. It's his word. And you're like, you know what? I do believe that. I have been hearing this over and over again, and you're going to be able to tell truths from lies. That's a great analogy, and I'll use it forever because it's so accurate and true. But the way to to test something that is counterfeit with money is not to look at counterfeit money over and over again and try to figure it out. It's to actually know what real money looks like, where they can bankers can do it by the touch. They can know by the touch. So they study the real thing over and over and over again. So when counterfeit money comes in, they just know, oh, no, this isn't real. Because I've touched the real thing so many times. I've seen it. I've smelt it. I've been around it. I know the real thing from the fake thing. Do you know that with God's word? Oh, I've been around the real thing so long. I've been around God's word. When something comes in, even if it's subtle, even if it's like, oh, it's disguised so well. Like, no, 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 it doesn't line up. That, that, that doesn't match what God's word said. I know it. It's been on repeat in my heart and my life. I'm able to tell the truth from the lies. And realize that sometimes actions speak louder than words. It doesn't even have to be something that somebody is saying to you. They're living a certain way. And they have, they have a good life. And we can start to believe that lie too. Like, look, look, maybe I can do that too and I'll be okay. If it doesn't line up with God's word, <laughs> it's ungodly and it's wrong, and identify it. And don't be afraid to be like, yeah, well, it works for them. No, no, no. If it doesn't line up with God's word, and usually we know, do we have, I mean, do we really need someone to say, this is wrong? Well, like, I think we know most of the time. I remember a few years ago, and I want you to understand this is what repetition is so powerful, and and we have to get better at it, and we have to take some like nods even from Jewish tradition and culture because other religions do it better than us. You ever get a knock on your door? Okay. Man, I, I give people credit that do that. Like that's not how we roll <laughs> per se. I'm not saying it's wrong, but people are dedicated. Here's another one. I was in an airport years ago. My family were walking through and somebody of the Muslim faith was literally on a mat in a crowded airport praying. And of course, you know, people are looking at them and whatever, and I, you know, don't subscribe to that religion of any way or shape, shape or sort. But I, I realize, well, that's dedication. Like, would I do that right now? Would I get on my knees and just open my Bible and begin to, to pray in the middle of the airport? 
No, that's why we love you. You can pray in your heart. <laughs> no one has to know you're praying. No, and that's true. But that person wasn't afraid to do that right there. What do you need Jesus to delete and then put on repeat in your heart? Think about this with your computer. Anybody have one of those virus searching capabilities? You, you should. <laughs> Every once in a while, we'll try to clean up your computer, and, and it's kind of like you kind of get scared and excited at the same time because it starts to search, and you're like, and it starts to like whatever the, the technology is, it looks and it looks, and then it will be like, all right, we found three viruses on your computer or free three uh, hacking software. You don't go, oh, that's nice. I don't care. That was cool. I just wanted to see that little thing go scrubbing across my screen. You look at it right away, and you go, and it says, do you want to permanently delete these? And you're like, yes, get them off here. But how often does God do that in our heart and our life? Or do we even let him? Like, no, don't, don't, don't go looking. Don't go looking, God. There's stuff I don't want you to find. Let him do a virus search on your heart and your life. Let him delete whatever he needs to delete, right? There's sin in our life sometimes. There's compromise. There's things that we've heard over and over again. And here's the beauty about this. Yes, they could be etched on, but Jesus is the only one who can wipe that etching away. Amen? And he could take it and, 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 and literally, like, easily remove that. And don't say, I won't, I'll deal with it later. Let Jesus handle it. Then position yourself this morning to receive. There's a reason why during worship we do this or do this. Okay? You don't get extra points. There's not certain levels of worship where you are. Okay? There, there's something about physically positioning yourself that gets you ready to receive. Because I guarantee if you're like this, it's a lot harder to receive from the Lord. And I did that for many years. My family used to make fun of me because they said, Keith isn't singing the worship songs. He's just chewing his gum. And I was. I would just chew along and just sit there. And I probably had my arms crossed like this. Because I had to get up early on a Sunday morning and be at church with my family. And, you know, we went to friendlies afterwards, so that made up for it. All right? But how often do we do that? Trust me. I, and don't, I, if you're sitting like this right now, sometimes it's really just comfortable. I, I've done it and caught myself like, do people think I'm really closed in right now? I'm just really comfortable. Right, Mike? <laughs> So, but, but there is something about coming to God and saying, okay, God, I want to receive. Now, this doesn't guarantee it. If I put my hands out, God's like, oh, well, I'm going to do it now. But there's something about that. Get your Bible this morning, even. If it's digital, let his spirit guide you and let the words jump off the page. Sometimes he will, if you ask him to do that, like, this is stuff God loves to do. He wants for you to receive from him. He wants his word to speak. Amen? And then pray. Praying is just talking to God. I always said that for years because people get really confused. Like, you know, hey, you want to pray with me? They're like, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, do you know how to talk? They're like, yeah. I'm like, then you know how to pray. <laughs> like, that's all it is. It's just talking. Heartfelt and authentic. Here's the thing, because God already knows what you're thinking. God, God already knows if you're like, Pastor Keith, come on, I'm really hungry. Hurry up, speed up. I got things to do. He already knows that. And he's going to let me go longer because of that. He's going to tell me, no, no, I want some of the people to suffer a little longer. Heartfelt and authentic. And here's the thing. Those are just a few simple things. And God wants you to what? Repeat that daily sometimes. Come before him. Scan my heart, Lord. Scan my mind. Delete the junk. Start to put things on repeat in me. Help me to receive from you. Help me to pray. Help me to read my Bible. Allow the Holy Spirit to let stuff jump off and, and, and work on me. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to ask Gabby to come and just play. For too many months, we, this, this area of our church laid dormant for many different reasons. And uh, I encourage you like I did last week. I know some of you, it's foreign to you. Some of it, you, it, it takes time to get into that. And again, there's nothing magical up here. There's just maybe less stains on this carpet than the back there. But there's something about getting out of your seat. I've, I've experienced it as a young person and even as a pastor. And I'll share a funny story so you'll feel a lot more comfortable about coming up. One time I'm at a meeting for pastors. And this is where I always try to give clear direction as a pastor. Um, and this is all pastors, you know, all of Long Island. I know 85% of them, and they know me. And the pastor's given this, hey, we're going to pray for a little bit, and we're going to pray, and he starts giving some real general things. And then 
like two or three people come up. <laughs> I'm laughing because I felt so ridiculously embarrassed. Okay? As I made my way up there, I came for what he said first. Like, hey, you know, you want prayer? And it was kind of very general. And then once everyone got up there, and he's like, all right, so we're going to pray for those people up here that are questioning their call in ministry. And I was like, wait, that's not why I came up. And I am sitting there wondering now if 85% of the people who know me are like, oh, Keith is questioning his call in ministry. And I'm up there praying. And I realized at that moment, like, God, it doesn't matter why I came up. You know why I'm here. And I'm going to pray. And so I want you to know that God will meet you in your seat. Yes, he will. He'll meet you if you stand, if you sit, if you do anything. But the point is, is to make yourself available. And trust me, I wanted to run right back to my seat and say, not me, that's not me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That's why I give a very general call this morning. I try to be very specific. And it wouldn't matter anyway, because if God wants you to seek him, I encourage you in this moment, do not miss this opportunity. And so if, he's, if you even feel like, like, I need to get out of my seat, but I'm scared, do it anyway. And realize Pastor Keith did it, and it was totally embarrassed, and I, and I lived to tell the story. It's okay. It's okay to feel a little funny, because at that moment, I just sought the Lord. And that's all he wants you to do. Whether you botch the, the, the call or not. And so I'm going to pray just a general closing prayer. But again, we're not closed. Um, I encourage you. Like, I hope you get excited. Again, I, 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 I prefaced all this. So go ahead, read Psalm 119, because we're going to read it again and again and again in all bite-sized forms. There's a lot in there, and I think it's important. And so, literally, I, I, I love this, this picture. Like, it's just that arrow following that arrow. Like, nope, what's going to be on repeat? Maybe just one thing this week that you need to hear from God's word. Maybe one thing God's going to speak to your heart and say, you're loved. Every day he's going to remind you, you're loved. I love you. I'm in love with you. I'm pursuing you. And he'll find all different ways to say it. I don't know what that is that you need to hear this morning, but God does. He knows what you need. Click on repeat in your heart and your life today. Let him speak. Lord Jesus, we come to you now in a way that opens our heart and our mind to you to speak. You've been speaking. You speak through worship. You speak through preaching. You can even speak through announcements. And God, I pray right now that we would allow you to continue to speak, continue to remind us of your truth, of your word, who you are, and then who we are. And I pray, God, for that person, for every single person in this room today. Let them not leave until they feel that message that you're speaking to them, that you're going to put on repeat in their heart and their life. You know what it is, God. I pray that they just hear your still, small voice today and they respond to you. Some will fill this altar. Some will sit in their seat. I just pray, God, in these next few moments, it's authentic and real. We need you, Lord. We love you and we thank you for what for what only you can do. You're the only one. And we trust you to do it in Jesus' name.